with the YouTube now and all these, these CDs, all that has to be made and you've got to keep the equipment updated. So we have that, we're working. Anyway, in the book of Numbers, 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 the book of Numbers 21 and verse 4, we're going to have a little time with this this morning, then I, I we'll see how it goes, what way the Spirit of God wants to work. But at the end of it, I can't stand and talk to you this morning. I've got to skip out of here in a hurry. But we will not hurry the Holy Spirit. You understand that? We'll do what God wants us to do. I will not cut back on what God wants to say. I understand because it's not about a message. I got over preaching messages a long time ago. This is not about messages. This is about people. And people are in desperate need. People are, are, some are right in the top of the wave, some are sinking to the bottom of the sea, and we need to understand this is not just a Joe message or a sermon, forget about that. This is, I like to hear the voice of God saying, say this to the people to encourage them, say this to instruct them. So this is one of these instructions. When I was in prayer during the week, uh, uh, when, when Laura and I got born again, we started to go to the Nazarene church, which is more of a, more of a denominational style church, and we used to read from, and sing on the Sunday mornings and Sunday nights from the uh, Redemption Hymn Book. Does anybody, anybody here remember the Redemption Hymn Book? And there was one, I mean, I'd forgot all about Redemption Hymn Books 20 years ago, but uh, in prayer the other day, this, 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 this phrase from an old Redemption Hymn Book came, says, will your anchor hold in the storms of life? Do you remember that? We're not asking you to sing the whole thing, because I, I had forgot about it over 20 or 30 years, but just this one verse, will your anchor hold in the storms of life? And, and, and immediately Immediately that the phrase came and I repeated it, will your anchor hold? I thought I was going to sing it to myself, but I didn't. But will your anchor hold in the storms of life? And, and within a second I had a vision. Within a second I could see the storms of life. I could see a storm that was outside of a harbor wall. I could see the harbor and in it was the small boats. They were pleasure boats. They were boats that people paid a lot of money for, but they're in this safe haven. And you can see outside the wall, the, 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 the storm was like a hurricane blowing, but because they're in this safe haven, it was, to a smaller degree, it was safe. But even though they were in a safe haven, the storm was still reaching over the walls, and it wasn't as rough as being out there, but it was rough enough. It was still storm inside the harbor. And I could realize, and, and in the vision, I was asking the Lord, and I said, how come those little boats aren't being thrown to the shore? How come those little boats aren't being taken out into major storm? And the Spirit of the Lord says, because their anchor's holding fast. And it was the anchor... In, and you can't see the anchor. The anchor's under the water. Sometimes you can see the chain going down. Sometimes you can't even see that. But the anchor was there. And I realized at that point that the anchor, their anchor of their little boat, if the, if the storm had had its way, it would have been thrown outside the wall and wrecked or else puffed onto, onto the, the rocks. But because their anchor was holding, it wasn't. And I realized at that point that the anchor was just a little bit of chain was just a little bit of chain, it was a bit of metal, but it was stuck under the whole earth, under the ocean floor. And God says, as long as they're on the rock, just check to make sure that you're confessing the word, that you're standing on the word, just make sure that you're worshiping me, because those that's the chain that links. And he says, the chain that links in the anchor, and the anchor is firm into my grace, into my mercy, into my favor, and into the word that cannot change. He said, that's the reason they're not destroyed. That's, they can feel the storm a bit, but they're not destroyed, and they will not be thrown to the waves. God says, just make sure the check to see that their anchor's firm. Look at somebody say, is your anchor firm? Absolutely. God is, God is not against you. God is for you. And you just make sure your word's there and your worship's there and your prayer life's there. You just make sure, and even your works is there. You're doing your good works on the human beings because you love the master in serving him. If you make sure that your anchor will be firm, and of course the storms will be there, but in the storms of life you will make it through. I want to read you Numbers 21 and verse 4, and it says, and they, that is the children of Israel. Now at this point, Israel is out of slavery. They're out of bondage. They have been rescued by the Father. They're totally out. They're free. Uh, and the Bible says uh, uh, they're out. Not only are they out now, they're on their way. They're on their way to the promised land. They're on their way to their promises, on the way to everything that God had for them and every expectation of the heart. They're on their way to it now. But it says in Numbers 21 and verse 4, And they journeyed, Israel journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea and that compasses the land of Edom. Now listen to this next line. And the soul of the people were much discouraged because of the way. 
the soul of the people were much, was much discouraged because of the way. You and I as believers, we live our lives in a way and a manner that, that we are doing our best with everything inside us to please our Heavenly Father. We don't always get it, wrong, get it right because we're human, but to the best of our ability and as often as we can, we're walking in a manner that would please Him. We're trying to be led by the Spirit so that our life would be a testimony and our life would bring pleasure to the Father. We're, we're doing the best we can, but even though you're doing the best you can and your relationship close with the master and God has talked to us at different times and different seasons even that it does not exclude you from the troubles that the enemy wants to bring your way and I find out that with especially with believers one of the greatest battles that you and I will fight and continually to the day that Jesus Christ takes you home one of those forces that you're going to have to withstand is a simple thing but it's a deadly thing and it's called discouragement no matter how close you are to the master discouragement will come it will try to get in it will try to make a way it will try to get you talk the way it talks it will try to get you to give it an opening uh, it doesn't matter how what, what else you're doing and everything you're making right it, it still comes for no reason it'll, it'll just drop in you it'll, it'll compass you like a like a dark cloud it'll come and it tries to get down on the inside of you and hangs over you like a cloud but uh, when you get to that point and discouragement gets you you don't smile anymore you don't sing anymore you don't talk anymore the way we're supposed so it's like death warmed up. But the Bible said this in Psalm 40 and verse 1. Here's what David says. He says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me, and he heard my cry. And then he brought me up out of that horrible pit, out of the merry clay. He set my feet upon a rock. He has established my goings, or put me back on my destiny. And listen to this. He has put a new song in my mouth, even praises to our God. I need to tell you this morning, I'm talking directly to people that's that's. Uh, feeling the pressures of discouragement. Maybe you're right under discouragement and you don't have a song anymore. But I want to tell you something God has promised you this morning. He will do something about your situation to cause you to sing again. Look at somebody say, I'm going to sing again. I, I, I remember when I started to put this together, a story I had told it for, for many years ago. And some of them stories is that good that you don't, you don't, you never forget them. But there's this one, and it was a, a lady I was talking to one time, and she had bought this little bird, and and she lived on her own, and she was always lonely, and she she went and she bought a bird, and she looked for the one that could sing the best, and she bought this bird, and and, and she put it in a little in a little perch right in her living room, and she said it, it it sang this little song, it sung morning and noon at night, but it wasn't like a budgie squawking. It, no, no, no. It wasn't like a crow. This thing had such a sweet song that when people would come into the house, people would remark how, how wonderful that little song was. And it seemed to be that little song. It just brought a whole cheer and a joy to, to her whole household. And one day then, she was cleaning up her house and she decided that she would clean out the little bird cage as well. And she was vacuuming. She was vacuum cleaning the, uh, the, the, uh, the floors and she thought, I'll just take the end of this I'll stand up on a chair and I'll just clean out the little budgie cage. And she opened the cage and she was uh, uh, cleaning out this thing and she dropped her phone. She dropped her phone. So she reached down real quick to do it and of course the chief went up in the air and she heard this <laughs> sound and she looked up and the bird had disappeared. It seemed to have raptured. One minute was there singing, the next minute that bird had just disappeared and she looked all over the place and couldn't it. And then she said, I think I know where it is. For whatever reason, because the tube had just, it got sucked down the tube. Look at somebody say, I know how it feels. I know how it feels. It got sucked down the tube. So frantically she got off. She opened up the dust bag and got around all the dust and all the, the stuff out of there. And she picked it up and it was still alive. And she blew on it. They blew the dust off it. And she licked her fingers and scraped off the, 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 the dust from off his little eyes. And, and, and as much as she could out of his little beak and, and cleaned it up and dusted down the feathers but of course the feathers now standing up on his ears some of the feathers weren't even there anymore it was a scaldy looking thing and she said she put it back up on the perch again and she said but you know someone that bird never sang again 
It never said, since it just sat stern into space like a zombie. It never moved. It only moved his head to feed a little or to drink. And it went back into this zombie position. Never sang again. I remember telling this story one time before. Do you remember that? And, and uh, when I told the story, I thought it was a good sermon. People never heard the sermon. All they could think about was the bird that got sucked down the tube. And people stopped me on the way out and says, what happened to the wee bird? Well, I used to just tell them when we made it into the stew afterwards, it was good. <laughs> But the freak died. But nevertheless, this bird never sang again. It lost its song. It never sang again. You know, I meet people all the time in Christian circles. I meet them in every churches and every denomination that have lost their song. And it's almost like they, things was going well. They had a song. Life was going well. Then suddenly the vacuum cleaner of life just sucks them down in. They weren't expected. Where did that come from? Before the Lord, and they're into things they never thought they'd be into. Can't get out of it now. And even though they get dusted up and they're not dead and they're good, they get back up, but they sit there like zombies. And they lost their song and they can never seem to get it back again. And let me tell you something, but God says, I'll give you a song to sing again. I'll put you back on the perch and I'll put a song on the inside of you. It's almost like he's saying to you this morning, but you've got to clean away your eyes so as you can see again. For your vision is clouded. You've got to see the things that God wants you to see. You've got to clean your mouth so as you can start talking the things that God wants to talk through you and to you again so that you can sing. You need to shake yourself up down. Look at somebody say, shake yourself down. You need to shake yourself down so that you can do it. And I, I, I read a story many, many years ago in 1950s. I know you're thinking, what happened to the bird? Well, it just never sang again. So get off the bird now, okay? I'm talking about being sucked down into, into life, into the vacuum cleaner. But the, I remember reading this story many, many years ago, a man called J.P. Berkeley. And I couldn't remember all the details because it was so long ago when I read it or heard it. But I remember this, this about him, that he was born in the 50s, 1950s in America. He, he was born into a very, very poor family. They had absolutely nothing. And when the boy was born, we called it disabled. In that day, they called him crippled. His legs were just wouldn't work. They were deformed in whatever manner. And because they were very poor, they didn't have all the treatment that they had now. And, and his daddy, uh, uh, instead of having a pram and the stuff we would have, his daddy made him a box with wheels on it so as they could wheel the boy about because of the deformity of his legs. And uh, they made him another box to sit in in the house so as he could more or less prop himself up when he would sit there. And they propped him up in his room every day and it was beside him. In them days they just brought out little radios and they'd put on a radio. And uh, when there was a certain time of day in the 1950s that Oral Roberts used to have a healing hour of power every, every day it was on. And when they put this little boy, J.P. Berkeley, into the box, they set it beside the radio and every day Oral Roberts would come on. And this is the man's testimony. When he was just a nobody, just a wee, wee, just a wee kid, uh, in this box, couldn't move. He says, the voice of God spoke through all Roberts to him, to reading and telling the story, how Jesus told the man to take up his bed and walk. And something inside that boy, when he was only three or four year old, turned around and said, I gotta get out of this box. I've got to get out of this box. And he rocked back and forward, and he moved back and forward, and couldn't seem to get out. But every day, Oral Roberts would come on and basically preach along the same message. And every day he would say within himself, I've got to get out of this box. Till one day with all his strength he managed to topple the thing over and he rolled out onto the floor. When his daddy heard the racket and the noise, he came running in and he lifted little J.P. Berkeley up and put him back in the box and said, you can't walk. Get back in the box and stay in the box. But something inside that little boy said, I refuse to stay here. God said, take up your bed and walk and I will do it. And every day he would go through the same motion, rocking back and forward till he would turn the box over and his daddy would lift him up and put him back in and said, you cannot walk. Just stay in the box. And he said, one day I was out of the box and one day he said I said oh God help me just a little child now just a kid he said oh God help me and he said I stood to my feet and he said when I stood to my feet he says I pointed to the box and he says I will never be back in that box again and he says God help me and the power of God hit him and he was able to walk I thought man what an amazing story but as even as people looked at him his own people looked at him wouldn't you think they'd be trying to help him out of the box but they didn't they just said you will never you cannot so stay in the box I found that life is basically the same there's people who don't believe in you and people think that you can't 
and people will say that you'll never, but you have got to have it down on the inside that I'm not staying in this box any longer. It may take you a year, it may take you two years, but you have to have winning on the inside. You've got to have this thing that I'm not staying in this predicament uh, any longer than absolutely necessary. I'm getting out of the box. Look at somebody say, I'm getting out of the box. But the enemy will try to convince you that you're a nobody, that you're a nothing, that nothing good will ever happen to you, that this mistake was too big and you'll finish, and he'll just tell you, just sit where you are, but get it on the inside of you. Because the Bible said in Psalm 40 that David said, I was in a, in a horrible pit. You know what the word horrible pit in the, in the Hebrew is? A deep wasting place. And life wants to, your life will be wasted if you continue to sit where you are. You have got to shake it off. You have got to get up. You have got to get it on the inside of you and say, I do not have to stand here. I do not have to be as well. I'm coming out of this in Jesus' name. It was in that psalm that said that the soul of the people, the whole attitude of the people was much discouraged because of the way, because of the way things were because of the way things had been, because of the way they had to live at that time, because of there's things they had to put up with that they didn't have to put up with before. Just a, just a never-ending cycle of madness. They were the things. They were the things that was holding them down into that horrible pit. And because of that way, they were discouraged. But here's what the Bible said in the midst of that. Joshua was recorded. Joshua spoke it, but he recorded it in Joshua 1 for us. In verse 8, it says this, Let the book of the law not depart. That's the word of God. Don't let the word of God depart out of you. Don't let it... Uh, let me read it to you. Let the... That this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. And always, you always got to be with it. But you shall meditate therein day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that's written therein. For then, so there's a prerequisite to the success. There's, there's things that has to be done before prosperity comes. There's things that has to be done before you ever get out of the box. He said, listen, do not let the word of God depart from your mouth. Meditate therein day and night to observe, to do what's written therein. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. That basically tells me that success is there for everybody, but not everybody will take it. Not everybody will gain it. The prerequisite for moving to the next level is the Word of God. Finding the Word of God, meditating on the Word of God until it gets on the inside of you. The next verse says, and here's what God says, Have I not commanded you? That's not God making a suggestion. That's not God saying, come on, well, do you want to do this, son? Would you like to have a wee go? That's not what God's saying. He said, I command you. Like he commanded you not to commit adultery. Like he commanded you not to commit sin. Here's a command. He says, have I not commanded you? Be strong. He said, I'm commanding you. Be strong and be of good courage. Be of good courage is the opposite of discouraged. He said, I've commanded you, be strong, be of discourage, and stop being afraid, and do not be dismayed. Dismayed means you give up, you feel hopeless. He said, stop that. I command you. This is not Joe Corey. I've got to listen to this word like everybody else. But there's a commandment. He says, have, have I not commanded you? Be strong, be, do not be discouraged, do not be afraid, and do not allow yourself to become into that hopeless situation. For the Lord your God is with you everywhere you go. In every scenario, in every situation, God says, I am there. Do not allow this discouragement to get on the inside. You get the Word of God and stand on the Word of God. And then let the Word of God come out of your mouth. The Word of God will create a path. The Word of God will get underneath you and lift you up. The Word of God will break the chains from off you. If you do not, if you go the other way, then you will speak the wrong words. And the wrong words will have the same effect. They will create an atmosphere. They will create chains. They will loose you. They will chain you. And the more you talk discouragement, the deeper you get into the pit. The way to come out of the pit is say what God says. Side with what God's saying. Refuse to speak negative, death-filled words over your life. If you do, it closes a lid over your pit, and you will be in a horrible pit. God wants to bring you out of the horrible pit. He didn't put you in there in the first place. Many times the pits in it, we're in it because we agreed. We said what the enemy wants us to say, and we slammed ourselves right in there. They got discouraged because of the way. Understand the way. The way was to paradise. The way was to the promised land. The way was to fulfillment. But they allowed the negative thinking on a short journey to overwhelm them, what put them right in the pit themselves. It wasn't God done it. They did it themselves. 
You don't, do not agree with your feelings. Don't agree with what the devil says. Don't agree with what your body says. Don't agree with what people says. Agree with what the report of the Lord says. Because that paints a whole new picture for you. Ordinary folk don't understand this, so they paint a negative picture, and that's the blueprint for their life. Change the picture. Change your thinking. Change the picture. It takes a while for that picture to come to pass, but whatever picture you're putting up there, that's where you're going. If you see yourself down before you, you might as well make your will now and give me the psalms and hymns that you want sung at the funeral because you'll not make it to 41. Whatever picture you're painting, that's where you're going. Where do you see yourself in three years, five years, ten years from now? Because three years, five years, and ten years will come. And one day you look back and say, where did the time go? And you're no further forward because you never drew the blueprint for your life. You never gave something for God to work with. You allowed your negative discouragement talking to hold you captive where you are. The Bible says, and we need to talk like this, that he is able. The book of Ephesians said he is, listen to this, he is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we are able to ask or think. I like it in the Amplified better. We're able to do exceedingly abundantly and indefinitely, uh, uh, infinitely beyond my highest dreams and aspirations. So whatever I can think, whatever I can hope for, God says, you haven't even got started on my scale, son. We need to get onto his scale. We need to think his thoughts and do it. You need to, instead of telling life, this is over, I'm finished, this is not working, you need to look in the mirror and say, it's not over yet. Look at somebody say, it's not over yet. You need to begin to tell yourself. There was a song that was out a lot of months ago, and not that I listen to pop music, but sometimes you're in places and you can't help it, and sometimes words get you. And there was one that says, I, 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 it was more of a rap type, it says, but I get knocked down, but I get up again. Does anybody remember that one? You're not supposed to remember that one. That's not out of your hymn book. But it's, I get knocked down, but I get up again. Uh, you're never going to keep me down. It was kind of a more rap thing. But I thought that's good the day I heard it in a cafe. I get knocked down, but I'm getting up again. Look at somebody say, I'm getting up again. You need to tell yourself, it's not over. I'm not finished. I will fulfill the dreams. I've got places to go. I've got people to see. And begin to reach out because there's people who need your testimony. There's people who need your love. There's people who need your attitude. Now, don't let discouragement get you down. Let me, let me focus on this for a minute or two because everybody in this room is subject to it. There is no human being outside of the realms of discouragement. We're so Because we're human, we're open for this, and it will come at you. It'll come at you at different sides. It's if you give in to it, you're in serious difficulties. Would you, what if it did? Then I, got, then I need to talk to you for a few minutes. There's a man in the Bible called John the Baptist. And John the Baptist was a fearsome character. I don't think I would like to have taken him out to dinner. He seems like kind of a rough guy. He, he, uh, he, he lived on locusts and honey, so I definitely don't want to go to his restaurant. And he wore, he wore a, lo a loin, sco a loin skin, uh, uh, thing, uh, like of a bear skin, so I'm not going to dress like him either. But I think he had a roughness about him because he was able to talk to people, look them in the eye and say, you're from the pit of hell and you're going to the pit of hell. I don't even do, I don't talk that way, but John the Baptist did. My, he just pulled it, he just told it what it was. Uh, he was as bold as a lion. He was as bold as a lion. He's the one that baptized Jesus Christ. He recognized, he recognized that he was the Son of God. Remember that? He was the first one and probably the only one that saw the, the Holy Spirit ascending, uh, descending like a dove uh, unto Jesus. And he actually heard the voice of the Father of God. He heard the voice of God speaking and said that this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. He, he saw Jesus. He, he saw the miracles. He, he, even if he didn't get to see him because he was always busy in the Jordan, he, he got to hear the stories. He got to hear. I, I dare say every now and then he got out to go and have a look at one of them crusades and watch Jesus in action about Jesus casting out devils. He was there at the birth of Jesus' ministry. He was there to see the things. He heard the stories. Whenever you're at the, at the Jordan and people's going, there would, every day there would have been camelfuls of people heading towards Jerusalem. There was, there was people going up that area every day and you could see crowds of them talking about when they get there, Jesus will heal them and all that. I could see him every now and then baptizing another one and stopping and looking at the cry and just smiling them to himself and saying they're on their way to see Jesus. Yet the Bible says, the Bible says, I like the Bible, it's real truthful. The Bible says, but there was a day when they arrested him and put him in prison. And he's not in the open now, he's not in his ministry, he's in a different environment. The vacuum cleaner of life got a hold of him. He's sucked out of the water, he's now in a dusty bag and he's in prison. And when he was in prison, 
something happened to him. I don't know what, but something happened to him. Somebody said this, wrote this in 1642, while they were incarcerated in a prison in England. They wrote this, stone walls do not a prison make, nor bars of iron a cage. In other words, a prison is not just the walls that surround you. That prison can be a prison of discouragement, a prison of distress, a prison of despair, of hopelessness, of regret, shame, guilt. It can be all those things that holds a person captive all the days of their life. And when John was in prison, evidently it wasn't just the walls that held him. Evidently there was a doom and a gloom that overrun him. And then John said, called his disciples and said, I need you to go back to Jesus. I want you to go back and ask him. And here's the man who heard the voice of God and seen the miracles and seen the things. And here's what he said in his moment of deep discouragement. Here's what he said. Is he the one? I need you to go back and just ask Jesus, are you the one? Can you imagine that coming? Look, if there's anybody that's not supposed to get discouraged, if it's anybody who's seen God in action, if it's anybody who's literally heard the voice of God and was there at the time of the miracles, if it's anybody that's not supposed to get discouraged, you never would have turned around. Well, for sure it's John. You never would have seen that coming. But the vacuum cleaner of life sucked him down in and suddenly he's in an environment that he's not used to and then he says things and is out of his discouragement encouragement he's speaking and he says could you go back and just find it and ask Jesus is he the one <sighs> he's in there you know I think the Lord put that in especially for the people that ended up in discouragement because let me tell you something discouragement is real it's not the figment of somebody's imagination it is not because a depression has dropped down your lineage it's as real as anything it's as real as them chairs that you're sitting in and he asked Jesus in a moment of madness, in a moment of deep discourage, he, would, he doubted everything. He doubted everything he had known. He doubted the whole, the whole ball game. He doubted and said, could you go back and just ask Jesus, is, is, is he the one? And when Jesus got the news, he just looked back at the fellow. He says, go back and tell John. Tell him I do the miracles that I've always been doing. The blind see, the cripples walk, and the, the deaf ears are open. He says, just go back and tell John that I'm still doing the same things that I did before, the miracle work in God. He says, go back and tell John to make up his own mind. And they went back and they told John. The most amazing thing is this, is in Matthew 11 and verse 17. This is where I brought you up to. Here's what it says. Now these are the people, these are the, the, the people, that, they're, 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 they're uh, talking to Jesus and asking Jesus. Jesus says, go back and tell him. Jesus never turned around and said, just tell him I am the one. He told him, here's my calling card. I'm the miracle worker. I do miracles. Just go back and tell John that. And the Bible says in Matthew 11 and verse 7, it says, as after they departed, that's after the disciples left him. He still got all them Pharisees and disciples with him. Here's what he said. After they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitude, concerning John. Now let's just set the picture again. Where's John? He's in prison. What's John thinking? Totally discouraged. He's even at a place where he's doubting everything he knew to be true. He's not doing anything anymore. He's stuck. And here's his, and Jesus began to say to the multitude concerning John, what went you out to see in the wilderness? A reed shaken in the wind? Uh, so what went you out to see? A man clothed with soft raiment? Behold, and they wear soft clothing. They that wear, they that wear soft clothing are in, in the king's house. But what went you out to say? A prophet? Yeah, he says, I say unto you, more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send a messenger before my face. Listen to this. And he shall prepare the way before me. He says, Verily I say unto you. Here's what Jesus said. Verily I say unto you. Among them that are born of women, there is none risen greater than John. Here's what he said. There's nobody greater in his ministry than John the Baptist. Here's where John the Baptist is, sitting in a heap, doubting everything he knows, and totally discouraged. Here's God, what God said about a man who's in a moment of madness and stuck in depression. Here's what God said. Had you written it, you'd have said, that filthy article sitting back there serves him right in prison. Sure, he's denied me and look at him. But God didn't. God overlooked a moment and God says, I'm fixing him up. He will sing again and there's nobody like him and there's nobody better than him and he's the man. Look at somebody say, you're the man. Unless you're the woman. Look at somebody say, you're the woman. 
Just look at somebody and say, you're not the woman. Oh, you are the woman, you are the man. I need to tell you this this morning. God is not angry with you. Look at somebody and say, he's not angry with you. Because in a moment of discouragement, you will say things that you wouldn't say when you're eating candy floss under a coconut tree. When everything's going well and you're doing things, it's fantastic. But there's a moment when discouragement can pile on top of you and you might just say things and feel like that God has deserted you. You might feel like God's not even on your side anymore. But it's written that you would know when John was in the pit of it and even doubting who he was, God didn't turn around and say, you're a nobody, you're a nothing, you're a failure. At that point, point God said I can recommend this man this man has it in the inside of him to do awesome things I'm here to yank you out of a horrible pit this morning and to tell you you'll sing a song again the enemy may have stuck that vacuum cleaner close on your nostril and sucked you right down into a horrible pit but God says I'm going to put a new song in your mouth look at somebody say a new song I had a vision one time I was preaching it was, I think it was in Balamina and, and, and many, many years ago, and I had a vision. And, and, and just before I left my room, I was praying before I go to preach. And before that, and I knew there was a lot of hurting people in that auditorium that day. And as I stepped, I stepped out of the room, the Lord said, I need to talk to you. I got back in, and I had a vision in a second of time. I saw this guy who looked like a Roman soldier. You know what they were? With the leather tunics, the brass shining. And it was almost like the start of a movie. It was, it was like I was standing in an underground place, a and the tunnel had these doors off the side of it and you just know in a vision what it is I knew it was an underground prison uh, I couldn't hear a thing it was darkness but I could hear outside of the walls there was war there was fighting there was screaming the, the sounds of war was just outside the walls when suddenly the door smacked open off its hinges and it's hanging in a pieces on the hinges and in stood this and in stepped this Roman type dressed warrior a giant of a warrior. He had a gold sword and he was dressed in a tunic. It was bright when the door was kicked open. And I realized really straight away the liberator had arrived. And he shouted down the corridors with a booming voice. He says, the war is over. The victory is ours. We have taken the city. And he walked down and he tapped the sword of, of cell number one and the door was open and one of the victims in there came running out and run down the corridor to freedom. He knocked the other door and the door opened in another one. He went down four or five doors and they all came running out because they're liberated in freedom. But the other doors were opened and nobody moved. And I almost thought it's an empty cell but it wasn't and he knew it. And instead of walking on out the other door, he stood for a minute and then he held out his hand like this. And he walked into the cell. And I realized that those people in the cells had been so badly wounded and so deeply discouraged that they were afraid that this is a trick just to get them out and then do them again or harm them again. And the liberator took time and he said, walked in and held his hand out and walked in with his head out and I could hear him saying this, it's okay, it's okay, the battle's over. It's okay, the battle's over and I've come to bring you out. And one at a time, he brought them to the door. And when they saw the liberty and the freedom, they were able to run. And he went back down and got the next one. The liberator has come. He's come because you've been used, abused, walked on, trampled on. And discouragement has found a way in. It can find a way in through the, the deepest crevice, the smallest crack, a slightest opening, because we had a song and we're on our perch and everybody's loving it, but suddenly something happens. And in a moment, it happens. And you're down in the dust bag of life and you're trying to pick yourself up. And at that moment in time, discouragement just slips right in. There's three voices in the midst of your life. We're closing this guy. I feel we need to pray with people. I feel, I feel the presence of God coming in here. But there's three voices that you will hear in the midst of your discouragement. There's the voice of the enemy. And the enemy is a mastermind at disguise. He never turns around and says, Hello, I'm the devil. I've come to destroy you. He comes with a subtle voice and said, God got you. Your sin caught up with you. God really hates you now. And if you, you know, it means you were a good Christian. Ha <laughs> ha! And look what God has done to you. The voice of the enemy in the time of discouragement always blames God. Always. It's just discouragement. Because when you blame God, who's your liberator? You'll never be liberated. You'll never be liberated. 
So the enemy, the voice of the enemy always blames God. He wants you to side with him. And when he sides with him, all you're doing is backing yourself up to an assail. He closes the door really gently. And he turns the lock real gently and puts the key in his pocket and walks away. And as long as you keep telling yourself, this was God done this. I don't like Christians anymore. Then believe couldn't trust one of them. You're just keeping the prison door closed. The voice of the enemy will blame God, will blame people, and will blame places. He never puts his name to it. He'll say, because you were in the wrong place at the wrong time. You should never have went there. You shouldn't have associated with them. You can't trust them. He'd blame God. He'd blame people. And he'd blame places. And he wants you to side with them so he can keep you in the prison house. The second voice then comes from the voice of people. And God, people, people, the, the, sometimes it's the closest one to you. Sometimes it's those that you expect never to do this. And, and I, I, listen, I've always carefully guarded my words in the pulpit. Because I understand a pulpit is a place of authority. And what is said is listened to. And, and, and especially when it comes to the prophetic utterance. I have, I have a fear of God concerning the prophecy. You say, well, you do it all the time. I know that, but I have a fear of God about it. Because you can say something over somebody's life. People, people will sell their house because you prophesied in the name of the Lord. People will leave this job and go over to that job because you said it in the name of the Lord. What if it's not God? What if it's not God? Did you ever think about it? Well, I want to prophesy, but what if it's not God? And you've just told somebody to, to break off that relationship. You've told somebody to get into that relationship. What if it's not God? You've just destroyed somebody's life. So I've always said, you, you got to understand this. We've got to understand how we move and how we act and, and people. And, and the enemy's subtle. He'll put good people in your way to say the wrong thing and condemn you. And when you agree with it, well, they said this. When you agree with it, you're backing yourself into yourself and you're closing the door. You're closing the door. And, 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 and I, I, I wrote down in my notes, if that's the way it is, then I need to be careful that I'm always encouraging people when I meet them in the like of congregations or places they got to uplift people because the enemies at work discouraging people. What if you and I could become the liberators and encourage people to get up and to go again? And the third voice is the voice of yourself because everybody believes themselves. I might believe you and I might not, but I believe me. And if I tell myself something, I'm not going to argue with me. I believe me. And so it's important that I then speak the word of God because the Bible, Jesus said, I am the truth and I am the life. So I need to say what Jesus said. I need to know what Jesus said about my circumstances. And I need to speak the truth. Not just, not just talking about not telling lies. No, no, no. That's not what truth is. Truth is the word of God. Doesn't matter what else is said. The word of God is truth. It will always stand. So I need to be saying what he said. And if I can hear myself saying what God says, I'll begin to believe it. I may not believe it for the first 10 days. But the more you keep saying it, you will begin to believe it. You will begin to believe it. And if you can believe it, you instead of locking yourself into the door, you'll open and liberate yourself and come out clean, come out free. But in the midst of your discouragement, you'll say things. You'll say things because nobody ever told you any different. You'll say, well, I, I, I don't know, but God probably won't ever use me in my life again. God's probably disgusted with me and I've let him down and how could God... And all you're doing is talking yourself into a prison. Jesus didn't disqualify John. We would have, as religious people, we would have disqualified John. As people, word people, we would have said, how, how, how could John have ever done that? He's a word man. Why is he? No, 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 no. Because discouragement is such a bad boy and such a sneaky thing that it's almost in before you recognize it. And if you side with it, you go under. And it closes you in a prison. God wants to put a new song in your mouth this day. He wants to put a new song in your heart. But you need to begin to say the things that God wants to say. Have I not commanded you? Be strong. Have I not, be, have I not commanded you? Don't be discouraged. Have I not commanded you? Take the word of God. Take the word of God and put it on your lips. Not enough to read it. You need to hear yourself saying it. 
Read it into you. No, we say, read it into yourself. I don't even know if that's good grammar. I don't know if, if people in any other land, land understand what we say, but say it into yourself. But you know what I'm talking about. But when you read it quietly into yourself, that's one thing. But when you come across a scripture that you like, say it loud. Now, you don't have to shout it on the rooftops unless you want to tell. But if you say it loud enough so as you hear it through your, through your ears, if you can hear yourself saying it that fast, you'll begin to believe it. You will begin to believe it. The enemy knows that, so he gets you. You think nothing of saying a discouraging word. You think nothing of it because you've done it all your life. And when it comes to the word of God, we don't hardly whisper. If you can hear yourself saying what God says, it will change you forever. And that fast, you'll begin to come out of that prison house. Discouragement is a subtle animal. And, and it has forces and possibilities. And but that was just the start of the way. After that, it got worse. But it opened the door that they never made it into the promises of God. They never made it to the promised land. They simply got discouraged because of the way. Let's say again, the way was taking them to their destination. They got discouraged. Discouragement was knocking them off track. God has such possibilities for you. You cannot afford to get sidetracked by discouragement. Now I'll say again, God is not condemning you because you got there. Because we opened ourselves to it. God is not saying, you're a rascal, you're out. He's not saying that. He proved it with John. He said, there's nobody like John. There's nobody like him. There's nobody like him. He's the man. So God has not discarded you. God's not rolled you up like a bit of paper and said, you missed it and it's in the corner. It's your thinking that's telling you it's over when God's saying, I've got something new for you. Got one more and then we're out here. And Elijah... And Elijah, Elijah was the one who called down fire. He prayed, and God answered that fast, not just with a little gingrown toenail pain gone. Called down fire, so as the whole thing went. The water, actually the water went on fire, and he took the prophets of Baal, and he slew the prophets of Baal. I mean, that's action. That's miracle work and power. 24 hours later, he's sitting in the wrong direction, in the middle of a desert, under a tree, and saying, God, I want to die. You know what the truth was? He didn't want to die. Jezebel had said, I'm going to kill you before the morning. And he ran, and her troops was coming after him. If he really wanted to die, all he had to do was sit down in Iraq and say, come get me, boys. But he ran. The reason he ran, because he didn't want to die, it's just he was so discouraged, he said it. It's called a death wish. And you'd be surprised what you will say when you're discouraged. And I'm here to tell you something. God didn't turn around and say, well, you've said it, so you can have it. You wanted to die, so die. Here you go. No, 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 no. God said, wait a minute, send an angel. Send an angel to bring him a fish supper. Well, in that day, as it was a little bit of cornmeal and a little bit of bread. But in our days, send him a fish supper. The angel came and said, eat and drink a little bit. Get your breath back. Here, lie down. I'll put the, put the quilt out over you and sleep. And the guy ate and then he sleep and he rested. Then the angel woke him up beside a fire, gave him a little cup of coffee. And then God spoke and said, come on, son, we have another assignment and a new mission. His discouragement, even though he said junk in the midst of it, didn't disqualify him. Now, if he'd have just sat down there and did something in his own life, that would have been different. But you're not at that place. And your discouragement has not disqualified you. And God hasn't disqualified you. And the liberator has come. I want to break that off you in seconds this morning so that you can run your race. There's an assignment for your life. There's possibilities. There's a new era. I would say, suggest this to you. If that was big enough and bad enough and discouragement came in like a rock and then, then the enemy knew there's... He doesn't know it all, by the way. But he surmised there's something big coming. And so he decided, I'll get you out of the road so you will never meet it. If you can just understand that this morning you're not finished, you're not washed out, you're hurting and you're broken and you said things in your discouragement just say oh God forgive me God forgives you because of the blood in a second of time there's tens of thousands have sat where you sat have been through where you've been through and they have made it and if they can make it you can make it this is your hour this is your time God has a new assignment he has a new mission it's a different pathway it's probably the end of the old assignment and it's the beginning of the new are you ready this morning for your assignment are you ready all right let's 
and stand to our feet this morning. Holy Spirit, do what no man can do. Joe has preached the best he can. The vela received it out of the heaven. But I believe this morning there's an anointing here for the liberation anointing that will liberate them from the very thoughts from the despair, from the discouragement. God, they are not finished. They are not over. We know that. You're not looking at them in disgust. You have not shaken your head and said, what a mess. You are liberating them, loosening them. You have a new assignment. You have a fresh anointing. You have something awesome for them to do. So I'm going to believe this morning <coughs> that the power of God will touch them and loosen them in Jesus' name. Is there anybody this morning that wants to come to the front and if you don't, I got places to go. I got places to go now in just a few seconds. But if you feel that discouragement, if it's hit you, if it's, if it's uh, living anywhere near your dwelling place, this morning is the time you need to get up. And I've said again, it can happen to anybody and everybody. You're not a failure because you went under. You're not a failure because it tackles you. It will tackle you. Absolutely. The, the bad news will come. Sometimes good news discourages you. Somebody else's good news will discourage you. All types of things. It's just a plan of the enemy. Is that everybody? I won't ask you what it is and never do. We're just going to pray this morning that that's broken from off your life so that you can run your race. Absolutely. You can run your race. And when you walk down and you, you, you hear yourself saying, I'm free. When you hear yourself saying, it's the beginning, the doors will open and you can get back to normality and get back to normal life. Father, I just thank you that the liberator, Jesus Christ, has come to loose George this morning. Whatever slammed the door, we open it. We break it down this morning that George Campbell can walk in liberty and freedom with an assignment on his life. We believe right now. We refuse to sit in the box any longer. We're coming out. We're moving like never in our lifetime before. We thank you for health and for strength in Jesus' name. I believe I believe for you, Ruth. I believe this is a new a new day and a new hour. I believe God is stirring you with some things. Look this direction. Look that direction. It's just really the beginning of where you're going. I believe that the discouragement will lift from off you like a dark cloud. And the sh sunshine of Jesus Christ will begin to break through and liberate the very depth of your soul in Jesus' name. It doesn't matter what's been said or what you're thinking. It's, a, it's just this discouragement. When we get discouraged, we don't sing anymore. We don't smile anymore. When, when every Everything's going well, and it was going well, and suddenly you get sucked down the tubes unexpectedly. You didn't do anything. It wasn't your fault, so don't be hard on yourself. It wasn't your fault if other people make decisions. That's not your fault. That's kind of what we call life. Life doesn't always go the way we want it. But don't allow yourself to get discouraged. Look in other directions. Make new decisions. You made the decisions before. You can make them again. Get up out of that pit. You can do it. Father, I'm going to believe this morning that the very love of God will hit Anthony. He's a good man. He's very creative. Got great ideas, great things to do. He just needs a helping hand. Help him this morning, Holy Spirit, as we liberate you in Jesus' name. I'm going to believe right now that discouragement will not be the order of the day. That you'll look at it and see it for what it is and you look in the eye and say get away from me you have nothing to do with me and I believe God will give you fresh vision and stir you afresh so as you laugh again and you'll sing again and your song will come back and I'm going to believe that great things will begin to happen to you and your household this Christmas it'll be a great time focus on what you're doing this season and let God arise on the inside of you in Jesus name you got a lot the enemy would say to you you have a lot to be discouraged over after all you've been through the enemy plies it on no you have a lot to rejoice over at a time such as this. God will arise on the inside of you. He'll give you a new song. I know there's, when, when you go through grief, that doesn't clear up overnight. But you still, there's no right for discouragement to get in. So I'm going to believe that'll be a new day and a new song on the inside of you so that you'll have a fresh assignment on your life. That you learn some things from the places we've been. But you begin to say, oh God, let me help other people through this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I, I was, uh, uh, the, last, the last weekend I was sitting here, I could hardly hear a stick. I could hardly hear a thing. And, and I, had, I had something wrong on my left ear for 10 days. Couldn't even get a doctor's appointment. Unbelievable. Our national health system's wicked. Anyway, couldn't hardly get, a, couldn't hardly get a, a, an appointment. But I couldn't hear. So when I stand up here last week, couldn't hear the singing. Couldn't hardly hear what they're saying. Mr. Burt was saying things about me. All I could do is smile because I didn't know what he's saying, the rascal. <laughs> But I'll listen to the tape and I'll find out what he did say. Anyway, but let me tell you something. I got loose and I got free. And my hearing's back. But I said to the Lord just last night, I said, you know something? I said, I know what it's like for people to be deaf. I know what it's like now for people who's what we call hard of hearing. Because Laura would say things to me and I'd say, what? And then she'd say things and sometimes I'd even answer back on something that she never even said. 
nightmare. And, and, and uh, it, was, it was desperate. Sometimes she'd be shouting, and I'd say, Still can't, I don't know what you're saying. Is that an S or an E? And it was a nightmare. <coughs> and I said, Lord, last night, I know what it's like for people who can't hear. And I know what it's like now for people that's deaf. And I said, I said, you know what I'm going to do now everywhere I go? I'm going to pray for deaf people. I said, I may pray for 40 before I get a breakthrough. But I said, I know what it's like for them, and I don't want like anybody to go through it. So I'm going to pray for deaf people. And I'm going to believe God. I'm going to believe God that God opens people's ears again so that they don't have to suffer. Sometimes in what you suffer, instead of turning around and blaming the devil, and sometimes in what you suffer can be the beginning of something in you avenue, you and you say, well, well, I'm going to set them captives free. Whatever you're going through, why, why not think to yourself, I'm going to make sure that nobody ever goes through what I've went through and ask God to give you an anointing to liberate other people. Are you with me? Now, Father, I just believe this morning that that discouragement that lingers over me and set us down the lineage and coming down the bloodline. It happened this morning that we're loosed and liberated, that we'll sing again, guitars again and paint again with a phrase. The joy of the Lord will be our strength. We will not listen to the dictates of the enemy ever in our lifetime. We'll speak the word of God and we'll hang about with people that really cares about us. And we're coming out of this pit and we're coming out of it now in Jesus' name. Are you ready? We refuse to get discouraged. Doesn't matter if bills are mounting, doesn't matter if the weather's bad, doesn't matter what's going on. God, you said you'd make a way where there is no way. You are on our side. We will meditate upon the word, speak the word. Then we will have success. Then we will have our way will be prosperous. Then things will work for us. If things are working for us, of course the enemy is going to try to make it look bad. But we believe that you'll always make a way of escape. You'll always cause us to triumph. We discard and discount any words of discouragement spoken over you the day or over the last days. We believe right now we're coming out of this and we're coming out of it quickly. And that doom and gloom will leave us in Jesus' name. Amen. Look at somebody say, I'm out from under it. But I'm going to believe right now this is a liberating morning. I believe the anointing in here will, will go beyond this. The people that's even watching on YouTube will begin to feel the effects and be different from it. But we will not succumb to that. We refuse to go under. So we're going to, we're going to believe today, wherever people are, whoever's looking, whoever's listening, that they will be liberated this instant from that foul, filthy thing in Jesus' name. Amen. That sounded like a Daniel Bird statement right there, didn't it? Foul, filthy thing from hell. Absolutely. All right, God bless you. We got to go. God bless you. I'll see you at 6.30 tonight. Amen.